Welcome to RGBA, Careful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 80. My name is Alexandre Valliar-Lagassi, and I'm joined by my co-host, Tadimina. So one news that we basically skipped last week, uh, we weren't really sure about it, I, and since then I read about it a bit more. The iPhone, iBoot, and other internal tools were leaked. Um, so a bunch of four or five guys basically had access to this uh, iPhone iOS iBoot, which is basically the software that makes sure that whatever is booting in terms of executables on the iPhone is legit and it's not like a hacked version or whatever. So this is kind of like the, uh, let's say the first line of defense whenever you have a jailbroken phone so that this iBoot thing will make sure that it's not booting if it's not legit. So this thing was leaked and hopefully, thankfully, it's not for iOS 11, it's for iOS 9. So the impact is less. Not so many people are still on iOS 9, but still, this will be a real uh, field trip for any hackers or any security researchers because they can now have access to the code, the source code of parts of the OS that is usually hacked when you want to jailbreak a phone. So they will most likely have a couple of weeks of leisure time digging through the code and finding some exploit and testing them again in iOS 11 to see if they're still there or if they haven't they have been patched or not. Uh, the interesting thing is, okay, of course, the iBoot code was leaked and it was published to GitHub. So that's interesting for researchers. But there's a second part to this news. There's also other internal tools. We don't know exactly what this means. Uh, we don't know if it's uh, tools to compile apps or tools to sign apps or I, I don't think so. That I don't think that certificates or stuff like that were leaked. But still, the uh, other internal tools will eventually come out public in the coming weeks or months. So we this news is not done and we'll still hear about it in the coming uh, couple months. So that will be interesting. And we don't know who these guys are, right? No, because they don't want to get sued by Apple because of course, if they were able to get their hands on that stuff, they're not supposed to share it. They're not supposed to to publicly uh, like send these files around so they can be sued for uh, copyright infringement. So they ask for anonymity to Vice, and Vice will respect that. So moving on to this, I think it's the major talk point of the last two weeks uh, regarding Apple. Basically, people are saying that the hardware game of Apple is top-notch. There's no problem. The HomePod is exactly that, more in a few minutes on the HomePod. But the software game is getting down. There's problems with the code. There's problems with reliability. There are bugs. There are more bugs than ever. Some people even say, and it's a problem. So take it to Twitter and discuss this. And somebody basically gave out a tweet storm of exactly what he thinks about this. This person is uh, this person is Steven Sanofsky, who was basically the head of the um, the Surface tablet project at Microsoft. Since then, he basically moved on to uh, investor firms, but he still has. I don't know, like 15 or 20 years of experience working for Microsoft. And he started as a developer and went up the ranks. So basically, he gave like a super long tweet storm of uh, 30, 31 tweets, uh, exactly ex detailing what's happening with Apple, how uh, this can be fixed, what are the challenges. And it's like, I don't know why he put a, a tweet storm of 31 tweets. At this point, just write a medium post. But anyways, uh, I strongly encourage you to look at the show notes and read this. It's very interesting. This guy is super smart. Uh, it's one of the few execs at Microsoft that I follow because he always has a good interpretation of what happens in the market and in different products. Uh, he's a major backer of the iPad. He really loves his iPads. And whenever people are complaining that it's not selling enough or it's not a good product, he always comes back with comparison with other products. Even though he's an ex-Microsoft, he's not afraid to say exactly what he thinks. And that's pretty great. He's reacting to the Bloomberg, Bloomberg article by Mark Gurman. So Scoop Gurman or whatever the people call him. He had a big article uh, that Apple is planning to 
to not go so big as a like new feature wise on iOS 12 and just crush all the bugs or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we we kind of hoping that High Sierra would be exactly that, but uh, not really. <laughs> uh, not at all. No, yeah. So people, I think I, I'm I'm pretty used to see people complain about OS update and the problems that they bring to the table. But High Sierra, I think I've seen a lot more pain points uh, than in previous OSs, especially given that High Sierra was supposed to be kind of a let's not like reinvent the wheel and just put a little polish on every feature and make sure everything works well. And it's worse than before. So it's not a ideal scenario. So if Apple takes, let's say, in, um, I don't know exactly the, the, the schedule there is. I remember listening to an uh, interview on the Victor podcast with uh, Don Milton and uh, what's the other guy name? Uh, Nathan Ganetra about exactly how many months they have of development and how many months they have of bug fix before shipping a release. And mind you, this was like in the probably iOS six or seven days. So it, it's probably have changed since then, but still it explained that uh, there's only a finite number of months where they can work on new features. So if this year they decided to move the needle and allow, instead of, let's say, three months of bug fix, move that to six, then we should see some, some, some amazing uh, effects of that uh, change of policy for this release. So not so many new features, not so many great new features, but if everything that we have can just work better, then I would be pleased in a uh, unbearable way. <laughs> so, of course, this week is still HomePod week. Uh, there's been a bunch of news on the HomePod. Uh, the very first one I want to talk about is uh, from Darumpel and the Lupin site. He was basically invited to see Apple's labs where they basically designed and optimized the HomePod sound features. So the, there's custom anechoic chambers made uh, in Cupertino where they design uh, the sound response and the sound emission, if you want, of the uh, HomePod, vibrations and everything. So everything was super technical and he has lots of pictures, which is usually very rare. And uh, this really is interesting because those, those custom made rooms remind me of the antenna gate and the custom made rooms for antenna testing that Apple did. And uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, there's even specs, like for example, there's a chamber that sits on 28 tons of concrete. Uh, they wanted to make sure that there was going to be no vibrations and nothing. And then there's like super huge amount of concrete. There's super uh, thick panel on the walls uh, that can absorb any vibrations. So it's 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 pretty pretty impressive. So if you are if you like those kind of technical how-tos and how things were made, this is very interesting to read. Yeah, the room is at minus two decibel, so it's it's pretty low. Yeah, because if you ever did some podcast thing stuff, you you know that the 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 smaller the number of decibels, the two decibels is very small in terms of scale, uh, and I don't know, like a regular house is what, like maybe four or five. Eight, I don't remember, but it's a couple decibels more. And in this case, minus two is very, very, very low. Um, I've been in a room like this for like that's in the negative decibel or whatever. I don't know how you call it. And it's it's trippy for like the your, your, your ears and everything. You feel weird. Yeah, you feel like there's something missing, right? Right. Yeah, they, they even said if you stand in that kind of room for more than 45 minutes, you can even get crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it feels it's it's probably like used as torture somewhere. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but when I see these rooms with all the the like the foam on the, on the walls, I'm like, oh, this is a perfect podcast room. <laughs> oh yeah, it would be the, the best podcast room. It's maybe even too good. Yeah, no echo, nothing. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Maybe too good because you need so, some some kind of echo, some reverb in your voice, or else. You're just like robot voice. So, yeah, I, I would like to try it to see exactly how it sounds. But I don't think it's going to be the best, best, best room for any recordings. So, talking about recordings and sound analysis, there's a guy on Reddit who basically posted in the subreddit for audiophile, a, basically an audiophile perspective and measurements on the HomePod. Uh, the guy is pretty crazy. <laughs> um, he 
compared the sound to KEF speakers, the X300A, which are uh, in the world of audiophile, like a very good, like uh, not not top of the line, unaffordable, but like if you want to get serious and you want to spend a couple thousands on speakers, these are like the your your gateway drug if if you want. Uh, people who usually buy those KEF speakers, they usually have all the gear that goes with them, and that's when your whole sound system starts to go into the five to ten thousand dollars and a little bit above. So this guy basically got uh, his room. He set up his his room to be able to test and measure that. He uses like a calibrated microphone, which means that this specific serial number microphone has been calibrated and has like setting files to make sure that whatever is recorded is not like a feedback or is not something that is coming from the microphone itself. Whatever noise it will be recording is actually what's being emitted by the speaker. So he has a bunch of software. He also did test like clearly in front, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 30 degrees and whatever. And he also <laughs> reports the room temperature, the humidity and the air pressure just so that everything is like legit and transparent and just gonna skip the whole thing because it's i don't know how many pages of documentation there but basically for the price you're paying this thing does a better job than the kef speakers the algorithm that apple has that adapts the sound to the room which usually happens in the first couple of tens of seconds when you start playing music and then whenever you move the home pod the accelerometer inside the HomePod tells it to recalibrate the next time you play music is actually so good and the frequency response is so great and there's no distortion even at 100% sound level that this makes it probably the best speaker you can buy below $1,000 and we are far from being $1,000. So this is something that is pretty impressive. Uh, I knew, I was expecting Apple to give us like a good quality speaker, something that can rival the Sono speakers. But at this point, this is quite impressive. I was not thinking that Apple would put that amount of effort into a $350 speaker. If ever Apple was to go all in on speakers and create a whole line of products, yes, this kind of measurement, this kind of um, attention to detail would be expected to Apple and probably more into the $1,000 and above so price range of a let's say a full 2.1 sound system or whatever but i'm very surprised and i'm it's, it's i'm not saying that i'm tempted but i just want to rent one for a couple of days and just play with it just to hear it because i want to see what this sounds like and also he had a big uh too long didn't read at the beginning but it was all it's all um it's all strike now and he has this big explanation and he says to go read the comments by other redditors or i don't know how you call yourselves yeah the redditors um because he was not alone like in setting this up he he wanted to have some help and he wanted to make sure that whatever he did was right and at one point his numbers were so surprising that he said i oh, know there must be something wrong so he unplugged everything and replugged everything and erased everything and started over again and he got the same results so he was okay this is way above than what he was expecting in terms of uh, of quality. Did you read the whole thing? No, I started to read the whole thing and then when I realized that I was just like <laughs> at the in the measurements and analysis part and that was just uh, chapter 2 and there's like 10 chapters, I'm like okay, no, forget about it. I'm not going to continue there. <laughs> so I just skipped over. How long did he say it take? Uh he does he say? No. No, I don't think he mentioned the, the amount of time. Uh once he set up I guess it's not that long, maybe a couple of hours, because the when you're recording and when you're playing sound and you're capturing like the audio with your microphone, it's something that lasts a couple seconds. So depending on how many tests he did and how many angles he wanted to test, uh, that's where you could probably see uh, uh, the same test over and over again, and then that could maybe increase the amount of time needed. But I don't think it's going to be... Uh, something that's going to take him days. It's, it's probably something he did like in an afternoon or something like that. And then just writing up the whole article also. Well, it's not even an article. It's like a a small book, short book. Yeah, a mini book. Yeah, yeah, totally. And Phil Schiller tweeted about it also. So, 
Yeah, so that's uh, one thing that he did, which is uh, quite impressive. Well, Phil is known to retweet like super uh, high praised articles, so I'm not surprised really. But yeah, in terms of mini book, it's a uh, five hundred and five hundred five thousand and five hundred words, so it's uh, quite long. So it's the kind of thing that takes you like maybe half a day to write. So probably he took, maybe he spent over a day of work on the this whole thing. But uh, no, sorry, he says in the beginning, eight hours and a half of measurements and six hours of analysis and writing. So yeah, it's a four over, about fifteen hours of work. So it's a uh, quite intensive. So now we started to see also more videos on people uh, creating content with the iPod, the HomePod, sorry. And one that I want to report on is Sam Sheffer uh, from, he worked at The Verge and now he's an independent YouTuber. He details his very own first experience, uh, basically setting it up and then trying to, uh, to play a couple things on it and realizing that he only bought one EP on iTunes and that's what it's playing when he says, play me something. So it's not very diverse. He's a Spotify user. And then when he tried to basically airplay to the speaker, then it doesn't work. And that's where he basically films himself calling Apple support and having to do a bunch of things. He has to restart, repair the, the, the home HomePod, re, reboot his, 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 uh, his phone, then close all of his, the apps on his phone and eventually was able to get a second device and be able to airplay to the HomePod. So once again, a bunch of problems linked to software. So the way we're saying that Apple is not to the top of their game in terms of software, that's really it. Because the the HomePod itself is amazing sounding and whatever you send to it always works fine. But all the software thing, all the iCloud settings, share, and it's it's a bunch of problems. And that's his whole video is about 17 minutes. So he still cut a lot of it because I think he was on the phone for like 45 minutes. But still, just, just to get it to work on all the features reported, is still very, uh, very complex and still has uh, lots of uh, little kinks to to fix in the coming weeks for Apple. I didn't, I didn't watch this one. I know, like, there's for sure is going to be a little bit of, or a couple of, um, I don't know how you call them in English, but the citron, <laughs> like just lemons, yeah, the lemons. lemons. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, pretty direct. Yeah, so there, there's for sure going to be a couple of, of lemons, and it just happened to be this YouTube guy that documented the whole thing and. It makes Apple really look bad, but it doesn't excuse them for the quality of the software in general. And it's just like further proof that get your s*** together. Yeah, and, and probably also what's worse for this specific case is that AirPlay 2 was supposed to be available out of the gate when this HomePod was to be released. But for some reason, we don't know the details, it was pushed back a bit. And maybe the HomePod is not that optimized for AirPlay 1. And there might be some little bugs or kinks that were not, not ruled out because they were not expecting to ship it with AirPlay 1. So that might explain why there's problems. Uh, hopefully this would all be fixed and better tested with the AirPlay 2. That's coming up in the next couple of months, I guess. We don't have a date for that, right? No, there's no date. Yeah, so coming 2018, uh, AirPlay 2. So yeah, uh, but yeah, the... Sam is very transparent in terms of YouTuber. Whatever he has problems, he's not afraid of really like showcasing exactly his issues with different products. So that's pretty great from him. All of the other YouTubers, they might have had problems. They might have skipped that. Uh, we've seen most complaints are around Siri having just uh, way too few features. Uh, I think you can do uh, messages, you can do reminders, music, and that's about it. Like not even calendar. Uh, and for phone calls, you cannot initiate a call with Siri. You have to receive a call on your phone. And then from the uh, list of audio devices, you can select your HomePod. And yeah, so it's once again, software is not up to the quality of the hardware. And this little box can do so much more. Um, that's one thing that I was very surprised is I haven't really looked into Siri for the HomePod. I was thinking that it's Siri. So it's going to be the whole th same thing as you have on your iPhone. But no. Um, what do you call those features for Siri? Intense. Um, yeah, the intense. Uh, there's like seven, I think, intense on Siri. I'm not sure. A couple. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Less than seven ten. Or, yeah, seven or eight. 
but there's only three on the HomePod. So, for example, the very the very um, simple thing that people often do is uh, they just call the canister and they say, "Call me a Uber." But this doesn't work. Like the the driving, um, the remote, the the right calling uh, intent is not there. So that's not even possible. And you can see when you ask Siri on the HomePod, it says, "I cannot do X on HomePod." So it's always this same f- sentence that comes back whenever you try something like that. So yeah, uh, I, I'm happy to see that Apple still keeps, uh, s- still is very serious about music. But it's very sad that they had to push back so many features and release Siri, which is already having problems on phones, probably because of microphones. But in this case, it has a, a big area of microphones, and people are even saying that if you take a call from your HomePod, you sound way much better. So I'm not surprised. Uh, uh, I totally understand that, but it's sad that with such a great hardware, does not come equally great software. Okay, I was wrong. There's 11 intents. Voice over IP, calling, messages, payments, list and notes, visual code. I don't know what that means. I think it's QR. Uh, photos, workout, ride booking, car commands, car play, and restaurant reservation. Yeah, so you see most of them doesn't work with, uh, with Siri on the HomePod, so... It should, and I, I'm just hoping it's a matter of uh, of time before they're back, but still, they're not there for now. So there's a, an article uh, on Daring Farball about the threat of to the Mac, the growing popularity of non-native apps. Over the last couple of years, uh, basically since the Mac App Store implemented sandboxing, we've started to see more and more uh, electron-based, which are web technology-based apps. So they're basically web apps running in a native window. Uh, kind of like what PhoneGap did a couple of years ago. Uh, did my my fair share of apps like this in the past, and now Electron pushes this even further. Uh, it kind of embeds like a Chrome browser inside the app itself, so it's usually quite uh, intense in terms of uh, uh, memory resources it needs. Yeah, so that's not the best for 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 apps, uh, especially uh, on a desktop that already is RAM constrained. But still, it allows you to do a lot more things. And since it's web-based, it can get access to very similar features as a native app. And it's easy to update, and it's easy to learn to code for that. And there's a bunch of plugins so that most of the features you have natively, you can do with the web. Uh, there's an article that I just mentioned about from, from Peter Amon, which is a former AppKit engineer, that says that this is a problem. Uh, we should go back to performance. We should go back to efficiency. Um, and I totally agree. Uh, but for many, 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 many Mac developers, the problem is not that they don't want to learn like Swift or Objective C. It's because the um, sandboxing is so restrictive that they just give up, give up, and they they either go cu- fully out of the App Store and just sell it on their own site, or they basically do something different, which is go the Electron way. I don't think there's. Like there's nothing we can really do against this. It's always going to exist because, like, it, not everybody's going to be spending the time and money to develop um, native app, native native develop native apps for every single platform like Windows and so these Electron and whatever, like not services but toolkits or whatever you can use that 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 are able to be deployed on all environments are always going to exist and it's always going to be used a lot by big apps. So I guess there's nothing much we can do. Maybe make like this, like the another level of sandbox, which would be sandbox, but still make it easier for everybody to deploy code that works on all environments. But still, that's never going to work. Yeah, having a less limited sandboxing scheme would be something interesting. Because right now, like sandbox came up one day, and I don't think it really changed since. And there was a lot of people that were complaining, a lot of people that were publicly complaining about that. Uh, Very high, very high uh, praise developers, uh, even companies that were basically working on uh, on Apple platform for the last 20, 25 years, they were all complaining. So, but nothing was really made. I'm really hoping that now that there might be a little boost in max sales and that there's 
there's a bunch of uh, good things that were done on iOS recently that there might be some love put into this uh, Mac App Store because the idea of the Mac App Store is very great. Like I really love having a one-stop shop to do all my updates and I like see I like also the um, the sandboxing because it protects me from bad behaviors. But if it's so protecting that it prevents features, then it's a problem. So you need to to, to have this uh, level of protection evolve over time and adapt to the market and the needs. So to to be able to keep the Mac App Store as a relevant platform. And right now it's been missing so much uh, interest from Apple that looks like it that. It's basically not dying, but w most of what you have there is crap apps, uh, VPNs that are actually stolen your data and like a bunch of crap, but nothing really great. And the very few developers that are still there, either they're there because their app was published before the sandboxing and they are grandfathered in some of the rules they can not respect, but that's not a way to like build a business. So that's why they basically said, okay, this will be our last version and the next version, which will be a totally new thing, will be sold outside the app, Mac App Store. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just want to share uh, one little app in our app corner. Uh, it, it was interesting looking and it kind of brought me back to RSS reading. So it's been a while since I was actually following up on my RSS reader. And I think uh, when I just opened it, I had like 4,000 articles. So it's, yeah, I kind of left it uh, alone for too long. And this app called Fiery Feeds by Lucas Bergstaller. So it's better looking and it has just the right amount of data and not too much text, not too much pictures and seems to be uh, quite fun to use. I use it for a couple of days now. And I also have a couple of smart views, which are like for like um, hot links and must reads and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of uh, features that I can uh, start to use and that would probably make my RSS feed reading uh, habits better. The problem I have is that I subscribe to too many feeds and some of them, like let's say The Verge, they crank out like 50 articles per day. So it's not, it's not, it's not like manageable at one point. So I'm going to try something different. I'm going to unsubscribe to a bunch of those feeds and see exactly just what I really want, don't want to miss in that uh that app. So yeah, it's interesting to go back to this good old RSS reading habits. Yeah, I have everything in, in Twitter right now. Like I, I subscribe to, I don't subscribe, I follow, I guess, if you, if you want to talk in Twitter, I sub, I follow, <laughs> I follow a bunch of websites that just post articles like Daring Fireball and all that. And that's where I save them to Insta Paper and I read them in Insta Paper. I don't, I've never subscribed to the whole rss feed thing yeah the thing is that you are a completionist on twitter uh, so you can do that and for you if you complete your timeline every day you don't miss a thing but in my case i'm not a completionist and i got like three or four thousand tweets per day so i'm not gonna read them all so that's why i started to do the same thing at one point at one point but i was not able to catch everything and i kept on missing stuff that i really wanted to watch watch or see or read or whatever so that's why going back to rss feed allows me to have everything that i do not want to miss in one single place unsubscribe everything that i do not need from my twitter list so i only have the most important thing so mostly people and not services or news uh, agencies or whatever and then with that setup i think i should be able to get the maximum amount of news with the minimum amount of effort okay i just lied because we have uh a feed in Twitter, not in Twitter, <laughs> in Slack. Yeah, true. It's a, we have a couple of blogs in there, so, but not everything that I follow because there's way too many. Yeah. And then we have Nuzzle also that takes like an RSS, that takes uh, Twitter and pipes it into, like if it's more popular or if it gets a certain number, retweets it, pipes it into Slack, Nuzzle channel. And then I get those notifications and they go all the way to my watch. So it, it's usually more important stuff. Nice. Breaking news. Uh, we have a new article on the HomePod, uh, given that it's uh, still HomePod week. The Wirecutter pay basically posted a roundup of uh, not features, but observations on the HomePod. Um, there, it's, it's called HomePod flaws, but not deal breakers. HomePod versus Echo versus Google Home versus Sonos One. 
Uh, the very first thing that you see, which is also the thumbnail of the article, is that the OMPOD basically <laughs> creates rings on your wooden furniture. So at first I was thinking maybe it's vibrations, but supposedly the way that the, the speaker design, it's not supposed to vibrate. But for some reason, if you put the HomePod directly on a oiled wood furniture piece, it's creating like circles, like uh, similar to like, if you put like a glass of water on your furniture, it's going to leave, leave like a little stain of water. Well, that's the exact same thing that happens. And I'm thinking that that's probably why the Google Home, uh, not Google Home, yeah, Google Home Max, Google Max, whatever, that big speaker from Google comes with a little... Uh, I think it's a rubber or maybe fabric on one side and rubber on the other side, mat, on which you have to put the speaker. Uh, at first, people were saying that it was for vibration. Maybe that's an added benefit it, that it protects your furniture. Um, also, it's uh, they also mentioned that it's Apple only, so you need an iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch to set it up. If you have only like a like Apple Music on Android phone, you cannot set it up, so you're limited there compared to other speakers like Alexa Compatible or the Sonos or Google Home, which works across all devices. So that's not a problem. It's very skewed towards Apple Music. Uh, it's your either your iTunes Match and iCloud Music Library or Apple Music as a service. But for the rest, it's not a playing well with everything. And even Apple's own iBook audiobook are not even supported really. So you kind of like need to airplay it to it. So it's... It can work, but it's not very integrated. So once again, limited to HomeKit, that we know that. It's a single user thing. Yes, there's no external connection, so there's no line in or there's no uh, way to set it up to another piece of your stereo. And you don't get thousands of skills. So of course, if you look at the the um, Amazon skills and the call it the Google Home actions. The, there's thousands of them. There's integrations all over the planet. But in this case, you have only, like we said, the couple of intents that are supported. And that's basically it with HomeKit. And that's it. Uh, there's no dedicated app. So that's one thing that they mention. And you cannot pair it or link multiple rooms. So that's going to be coming with AirPlay 2. So you're going to be able to do multi-room audio and probably also pair two of them to make a stereo sound, but not for now. So basically the conclusion of this article, uh, if you're deep in the Apple ecosystem and you're happy like that, just go with it. You already have Apple subscription, so it makes sense. Uh, it's definitely uh, a premium product because you can get two Sonos One for the same price and you can even get two or three Google Homes or Amazon Alexa for the price of one single HomePod. Um, but if you're set up with HomeKit enabled devices, if you have Apple Music, then there's no way to prevent yourself from enjoying great quality music with your existing setup. But if you're not, then you could wait because there's lots of features that are going to change over the next couple of months. And also other products like Sonos One will be gaining uh, Google Home Assistant over the year and AirPlay 2. So at this point, maybe the sound is not as great in a Sonos One versus a, a HomePod, but maybe feature-wise, it's going to be more tempting. The wood marking part is really a deal-breaker for me. Yeah, because you just got a new house and you invested the, your life savings in nice furniture. <laughs> when I was thinking about buying this, I, I was thinking about putting it on, on, um, on, in the, like, the kitchen living room part on a, a buffet, a like side table <laughs> that's made of wood, so... That's not going to work. Well, you need to put something in between. So maybe a little... Uh, a plate? Uh, a pla well, yeah, not a plate, but maybe just a little mat, uh, a little fabric mat that could do the work. But then again, I don't like this either. It's it's it, I don't know why it's doing it. So it's, it's, it's scary. Because like I understand water. I understand like humidity. And I understand also if something is placed on a, on a furniture for many months, many years... But it's been out for what, like two weeks at most, and you already have stains. So I really, really don't understand it. And because the HomePod is there, you'll need to re-oil your furniture like regularly. That makes no sense. Like, what is it? Maybe like the the base is made of rubber or something, and the rubber is is transferring onto the wood because I, it says it doesn't. It, the stain doesn't appear on nothing except for 
untreated wood or, or oiled wood or like real wood if you want. Yeah, but yeah, well, see, the, the guy says he also tested the home pot at the same place with a Sonos One for many months and there's nothing. So I don't understand exactly it. Maybe it's something in the chemicals of the plastic. So yeah, this this will need more investigation because right now it's it's pretty scary. And exactly my situation is that my Sonos Play One right now is on a buffet like you mentioned, like a side table in my uh, dining area, and it's untreated wood. So it's a, it's a stained wood. So it's natural. So if there's water stain, it's gonna show. And my Air, my play one has been there for at least a year and a half, and of course, whenever we dust, we move it a few inch, a few centimeters here and there. But there's not a single marking there; it's it's pristine. So that's why, and that's why I put it there because the play one has little rubber feet, and it it's always um, like it doesn't vibrate, it doesn't move, and those little feet are pretty soft and rubbery, like they should. And that prevents from any markings. Well, in my opinion, that would be the case. But theoretically, with the case of the HomePod, it's something weird. Yeah, definitely need more investigation because I don't understand that. And the response from Apple was to just basically treat the wood like the manufacturer of the, the furniture says, like uh, re-oil it or something. But I don't want to re-oil my, my, my furniture just because I put a speaker on it. So very, very peculiar. It says... When placing on certain oil or wax-based wood finishes, uh, the marks are co- are caused by oils diffusing between the silicone base and the table surface. So it's like the base of the home pod and the oil countertop. Is, or oil is diffusing, like meaning that it's being sucked out of the wood into the rubber. Oh, I don't understand. It's a uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a weird one. Yeah, it's a very scary one. So. If you ever have an HomePod right now in your house and you have it placed on a furniture, make sure that it's either like a wood imitation, so it's plastic or MDF or whatever. And if it's not a case and it's real wood, please put something under your HomePod. Me, even just a little felt rubber, a felt pad or something, just so that it's not touching directly. All right, so that's it for episode 80. You can find our show notes at rgba.fm slash 80. You can find us on Twitter at underscore rgbafm. I am on Twitter at Valia, V-A-L-L-I-E-R-E-S. And I'm Tyler Menard, T-Y-L-E-R-M-E-N-A-R-D. Have a nice week. Have a nice week.